Okay, so uh, next I want to talk about a framework that I think is helpful. We've started using the last few years to think about our coastal, our coastal zone and how we talk about it, right? And how, and how more importantly, how we conceptualize it in our head. And so the phrase, uh, the descriptor for this is, is the imaginary, the coastal imaginary. Um, and so I'll explain that in, in a second as we look at this you know, kind of funky sea monster up there. Um, uh, again, sometimes in our science courses, we don't pay mm, a whole lot of attention to some of these things. I would argue that we really need to. In the case of management, if we don't understand the mental frameworks that people bring to our discussions, we can easily misunderstand each other or think that someone is actively attacking us when maybe they're not, right? Or that, or, or they help us um, understand how to better explain our, make our argument to, to folks and, and put it in a culturally relevant um, context. Okay, so, um, so the coast is, uh, now we're not talking about legal definitions here, but this, these are conceptual things. So first and foremost, the coast is an interface, right? And so an interface between the, the, the water and the land or the, the, the water and the air. And we see that in all kinds of different ways. Um, but the, the most obvious one is, is literally at the shoreline, literally where that water is slapping up against the sand or the rocks. Um, uh, interfaces are really important. So we typically think of uh, as the classic example, the beach, as you guys all articulated when I asked you to, to you know, describe the coast. Um, and that's true, but the interface happens wherever, right? Regardless of if it's sand or a rocky bench like this here uh, up, in, up in the Rincon. Um, and, and we can see here with the algae that's growing and the, and the life that's on these rocks, that there's a clear interface. As we go from the left side of the picture to the right side, very, very quickly, there, there's a change. There, there's, there are different, there's a different community that's there. Um, and this interface is sometimes mellow and sometimes it's dynamic. So this is last year driving near Thornhill Broom State Beach. And so water was overtopping PCH and actually led to the shutdown of PCH for some time. This is not normal. I mean, this is not routine. This doesn't happen every, you know, every storm event. So that this was very unusual. So that interface, again, sometimes stable, sometimes changing. Um, it can be really, really changing under, under crisis situations. So this is the Indonesian uh, uh, the, the, the earthquake, which led to a tsunami, which led to the horrible um, devastation in, in parts of Indonesia. Um, a similar phenomenon in Japan in the wake of um, another uh, under, uh, underground sea quake that led to a big massive tidal wave. And you can see how big uh, this is. Well, um, in the spirit of, of today being, you know, the anniversary of Katrina, um, just to, to reiterate, when we have these these types of events, they're not just a wave. Sometimes it can be a wave, but more typically it's a big, huge rise of the ocean. So what we're seeing here is the entire surface of the ocean lifted up over this seawall. And you can see for scale how big these cars and stuff are. So, um, so this, is, this is pretty ominous. You know, if that happened in one little area or one, one spot in a wall, that'd be bad. But when it's happening up and down the coast, it's, it's crazy, right? So coastal zone as an interface, a change between this thing and that. Also, these are highly productive. These are the most productive parts of our planet measured in terms of carbon fixation, measured in terms of biomass accumulated per square meter, however you wanna slice it. These are highly, highly, highly productive areas. Here's one example of that as a, this gull colony. Um, the most productive biomass accumulating thing on planet Earth is, the, well, the second most uh, productive thing on Earth is this. This is giant kelp. This is Macrocystis pyrifera. This is what dominates most of our reefs just, just next to our shoreline, right? Um, this stuff is insanely productive. So if we go to a kelp frond, which is, which is what you might think of as the leaf, right? If you, if you, if you haven't taken phycology or whatever, um, we're used to tree trunks and leaves growing. Uh, so like say the tree trunk, so here's my tree and the tree's getting bigger by adding a layer, right? That's what gives us the tree rings, right? So the cambium, the actively growing area is around the, the, the belly, if you will, of that, of that structure. With giant kelp, most of the productivity is happening on the fronds and these are literally conveyor belts of life. So, um, uh, so here's the stipe. This guy here is the main, what we might call think of the stem, right? This is the stipe. 
And then off of here is a little blade. So there's a little pneumaticist, a little float bladder, a little air bladder that helps it, helps it stay buoyant. And then there's what might look like the leaf. Uh, the analogy is a leaf in, in, on land plants, terrestrial plants, angiosperms. But this is actually um, uh, algal tissue, and we call that a frond. And the actively dividing area is not at the edges of the frond, not the edges of the leaf. It's actually at the base. And so um, what you can do, it's very, very easy to do. I used to do this as an undergrad. Um, uh, we go out there and we take a hole punch, just like an old fashioned paper hole punch. And you punch a hole in the front. Like, let's say, let's say like right here, poom, poom, right? And it's soft tissue. So it's very easy to choom, choom. And then take a ruler and measure how far that hole is from, from the air bladder, how far it is from the bottom of the, the base of the front, right? And then put a piece of flagging tape on it, right? Number 10 or whatever it is, right? Go home, you know, go back to shore, rinse off, go have our food, sleep, get up and I say, come back 24 hours later, go back to that same front and measure it. And under the ideal conditions, that will have that little dot, or that little pole punch will have moved one foot in 24 hours, right? So our most productive marine areas, and, and, and that, that's, that's a front, that's one front. The, the, the tallest um, macrocystis individuals we've recorded are uh, over 300 feet long, right? From the bottom to the top. Um, they're usually not that, they're usually much less tall than that, but, but they can be that big. And each of the, and this guy is a stipe, and there's potentially many stipes, dozens and dozens of stipes. Off that stipe are, are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of fronds. Every, or not maybe every single one, but the ma vast majority of those fronds are actively growing and dividing. And so that's why, that's one of the reasons why our Southern California reefs are so productive. We have this incredible bounty and almost everything on our reefs eats this that either lives in and hides in this thing or eats this stuff the urchins uh, uh the fish that are grazing on the things on the so that this massive productivity is insane it's awesome the only thing that produces more biomass per unit area per per day under ideal conditions it's not it's not growing that fast in the middle of winter but but in the ideal peak time Anybody want to guess what the, what the only thing that's more productive than that is? Uh, oh, good guess, but not plankton. It's, it's a plant. It's an actual terrestrial plant. Not fungi. Not seagrass. Sugar cane. Sugar cane. Artificial, massive amounts of, of, of fertilizer inputs and massive amounts of water input. So it's an artificial system, but regardless, sugarcane can add more grams of carbon per square meter per day than, than, um, than macrocystis, but it's still close, right? And that's a highly energetic, we're putting a lot of fossil fuels and stuff in there. So this is a really, so the coast zone is really, really productive. It's awesome. That's one of the reasons we have so many different fish and birds and critters and stuff. Um, uh, all kinds of productivity. Are the Christmas trees that you buy, even if they're grown in Oregon, even if they're grown in, in you know, Tennessee or whatever, the, the ideal Christmas tree around the world comes from our coastal zone. So that, that variety of tree has been taken from the California coast zone and planted all around the world. And it's what, what most people will see on, on December 25th. Okay, interface, productivity. Another key theme, heterogeneity. So the different things coming together, the, 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 the steep shore next to the, to the shallow shore, the, the grassland next to the salt marsh, next to the oak woodland, all that kind of stuff. We're, we're very heterogeneous. So check this out. So this is, I mean, we can pick whatever metric we wanted. This could be rainfall, this could be temperature. And as we go from one part, one area, let's say of our coast to another, we see tremendous variation, right? And so it's not as if, uh, so there's much more variation here than you would tend to see in say like a desert or something of that nature. Um, uh, one of the met metrics of heterogeneity is if we go from, we talked about that transition, that's another form of heterogeneity. We go from one level of things, say water or elevation to another, and we can see the plant communities, for example, change very, very quickly over a very short amount of physical distance. 
Um, the geometry of the co coast is also important. We've touched on this before, but, but the geometry is really important. Again, many of the, the management challenges have to do with the fact that this is really a line, even though it's, it's real world and it's three-dimensional everything, it really oftentimes behaves more like a line. And in terms of our policies and in terms of how we behave, we treat it more like a line. And you know, are you on this side of the line or that side of the line? Um, and so the geometry and how those geometries fit together are really important. Okay, next, with all that stuff in mind, I would say that the coast looms incredibly large in our society and our, in our people. Um, and there's a disproportional um, influence of, this co of the coast and the idea of the coast on how we think about things. So uh, we, already, we, we already talked about, uh, we just saw this video a little bit ago about the rum runners, right? And, and, um, and this idea of that's but one example pirates right my lab's called the pirate lab right um so pirates kind of outlaws that kind of stuff can thrive in the coastal zone right and that that's part of the lore we also talked about the south china sea and trying to come in and filling in the 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 coral atolls and stuff they're like you you a-holes you're kind of like you just do what you want you're kind of like wild west that's also part of the lore of the sea and that kind of stuff right um uh, and this goes, this is very, very deep. So this is Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed, who were uh, classic pirates in the classic sense of the pirate word. Um, but they were basically cross-dressed as they were women that, that sometimes behaved as men, right? And again, out of the ordinary, unusual, pushing boundaries, hard to control. This is this idea of, of the coast and the, and the ocean and that kind of stuff. Um, other examples from, from uh, uh, China hundreds of years ago, right? So the pirate queen who controlled up to um, maybe as, I mean, various estimates, maybe as many as 80,000 pirates and something on the order of 2,000 pirate ships um, uh, and in, investing uh, you know, huge controls over the South China Sea and, 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 and different parts of the world. Um, again, sort of lawless, like whoever, whoever want, has a power and wants to do it can do it. So that this idea of, of uh, all that is, is absolutely part of the coast and the ocean um, that has crept into our, our broader cultural conceptualization. It's also because it's the ocean in particular is far away and hard to control and crazy. It's the stuff of dreams. It's the stuff of imagination and, and in this case, sea monsters and stuff like that. Um, and we actively lay into that idea. So on the right is the endeavor, is, is Shackleton's uh, a failed attempt to get to the South Pole. Um, and their ship got trapped. And this is a nighttime picture with the ship frozen in Antarctic ice. And so it's a, it's a um, I mean, that, that's a whole crazy story in itself. And we can talk about that. Um, but uh, amazing that nobody died in that, fa that, that horrible fail, lots of bad decisions, but, but nobody died. And they saved almost all the film, not just still footage, but actually movie films. So we actually have this incredible survival story uh, documented. Um, and so, so, the, and so, so this example of like surviving the high seas and crazy alone in the middle of the ocean, like that's also part of the lore of how we think about these places. And then on the uh, right over there, so that's Leo Carrillo. Um, uh, we've used it as Hollywood, right? So we've taken over our beaches and literally made them the imaginary for most of the world. So we've converted them to look like the South Pacific or the Middle East or whatever. Um, definitely a world of dreams. Um, we talked about the out of sight, out of mind. I think I'll skip this part because we're kind of getting tight on, on, um, on space. But um, I'll say, so we, we also mentioned this example. Other examples, this, the, the ubiquity of coastal imagery is so everywhere, it creeps into everything. So here's an example of a, of a political cartoon from a couple of years ago. Um, and, and what we see here is this is the then, uh, um, then head of the EPA. Um, and, and when we want to show an illustration of someone that we think is doing something bad or, in, or, or not working right, what do we show? We show flooding, right? We show a big rise of the water, right? Um, it's so ingrained. Um, this is, this is uh, when we talk about the calm before the storm, what do you show? You show a picture of the beach with no storm waves, right? When we talk about COVID, every, just about every single story it seemed about, about COVID, people gathering, 
and, and, I, and this was crazy to me, news stories in Colorado, news stories coming out of Texas, whatever, the, the classic picture was people at the beach, right? aggregating the beach. And of course that makes sense for us in LA and Ventura and stuff, but it was also what people would use you know, in New York and in Chicago. And it's like, wow, why is this the image of people getting together? It's because in that popular, popular conception, um, it, the beach and going to the beach and when the beach is crowded, it's, it's so baked into our thinking about stuff. It, it's pretty crazy. Um, and so, so again, how we describe things in common language is also heavily influenced by the coastal zone. So here's this, I, I grabbed a, a, you know, some headlines um, and uh, the pandemic, the pandemic is spreading the DMV's road to modern, speeding the DMV's road to modernization, blah, blah, blah. It's still no day at the beach, right? Because that's a, a term everybody knows, oh, that's a fun thing, right? That, that's a happy thing. That's a happy place. Um, but it's not, it's used all the time. Any port in a storm, the tide is turning, a trolling, talking about fishing and, and sort of having these hooks that you get into, into someone, rough seas, uh, uh, changing the course of the ship of state. All of this is marine and coastal language that we don't even pay attention to. It's so, it's so everywhere. Uh, and then when we want to talk about political stuff, again, waves and tidal waves and, and being overtopped by stuff is a, another common um, a shorthand to communicate um, uh, forces beyond our control, for example. Um, and, and it's just used over and over and over again. And we, I, mean, I could just go on forever. Recession, you know, all that kind of stuff. Putin and Ukraine, you know, all that kind of stuff. It, it's all, it, it's, it's very, very easy. Okay. So, um, let's see, I don't know if we have, we'll do a couple of these. How about we'll do a couple of these? Okay. So, so one thing, um, that I want us to work on this semester, obviously we're gonna be reading a lot of stuff, a lot of literature, a lot of this and that. We're gonna be looking at a lot of data, but I also really want you guys to be working on your visual, uh, uh skills. Okay. So when we go on some of the, our field experiences, whatever, I want you to be looking, don't look at your phone. I want you to look at the the things that we're seeing. So to do a little bit of an exercise around that, let's take a look at some stuff. So Gazuntek. So let's get into groups of two or three people. So scooch next to someone, and we're just going to start to do some some practice stuff here. So first, have a look at this guy. Every stare at that for a second. Is the other guy's moving? That's not an animation. That's a stagnant image, right? So so uh, uh, so important has eyesight been to our species that, that you know, our eyes are really important, but our brain like has all these uh, assumptions that it makes when we see certain things. So when we see stuff like this and we stare at it for a second, it kind of looks a little wobbly, like a little bit of movement, right? So our eyes are powerful things. Seeing is powerful. So let's start with looking at some details. So, um, okay. So this is the first picture we're gonna look at. Let me turn off the lights here so it's a little, A little easier to see. Okay, so this is the first picture I want to see. So, th so this is um, so this is purely a visual rhetoric thing. Okay, so so I picked something that is just a little bit related to the coast to start with, so we can just have an objective thing. Okay, so this is a Saint Sebastian um, from Montaigne in 1480. It's a cool painting. Um, so I have a detail at the top and detail at the bottom. So get with your other person or your other two people, and um, I want you guys to tell me what you think is going on in this painting. Or interpret what's going on. So I know I haven't explained it to you. I know you don't know the history. I don't care. Just look at the visual parts of it. So um, ready, set, scoot in your groups, and then you guys start talking about it. And I'll leave it here. And in, in a minute or two, I'll, I'll kick to the, the other slide, the other, the, the, the detail, the downside. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh, I see the bottom? There's the bottom. Here, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna kill this zoom because this is kind of getting in the way. This is kind of stupid. Hold on. Uh, 